Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to turn the microphone over to someone who has spent, um, spent his career, it's interesting, working in at least three of the four concentrations uh, that the Manship School has. Uh, Len Sanderson's career has embodied journalism, political communication, and public relations. Those are three of our four concentration areas. Len, I don't know if you've worked in the fourth area of uh, uh, digital advertising, but you have plenty of time left. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. That's good. Thank you. I was going to say you have plenty of time left to do that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Len is president of uh, Sanderson Str Strategies Group, for which Denise works in Washington. He's been delivering confidential strategic advice to CEOs, industry and political leaders, uh, issue advocates, sports teams, uh, and players small businessmen and communicators for more than 30 years. Uh, he provides insight and, uh, and, and counsel based on a career that, as I said, includes journalism, speech writing, campaign management, serving as a Capitol Hill and a gubernatorial chief of staff, um, public spokesman, media trainer, ghost writer, and management consultant, among other things. However, most important, Len is a graduate of the old J School, the predecessor of the, of the Manship School, and is a member of our school's National Board of Visitors. So please help me welcome Len Sanderson. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, yeah, there was a vending machine right here when I was at school here. There was a stairway and a, and a vending machine. Uh, um, so there was a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of work that, that took place uh, underneath that stairway, but I won't, I won't get into that because uh, that would be wrong. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight, uh, to see the faces and, and to discuss what we're going to discuss. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I went to my first Major League Baseball game. I grew up, I was living in Lake Charles at the time, and uh, then as, as now, there was not a Major League team in Lake Charles. Uh, but uh, this was a time when there was a brand new team in, 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 in Houston. It was the Colt 45s. And we had a church trip from Lake Charles. And, and one of the church members was Alvin Dark, uh, who was manager then of the, of the uh, San Francisco Giants. Um, and so we took a, a, a church bus and we went over to, to the field in, uh, in Houston. And of course, that was well before there was a, a Superdome. The ballpark had a Western facade around it. Uh, uh, and at, at 11 years old, I was much more impressed by the fact that where we parked was in the Wyatt Earp lot than anything else, probably. At that point, at 11, I, I hadn't thought so much about baseball. I think I was still in the, my pirate stage, that I was going to be probably a pirate when I grew up. Uh, that's why I came to this school, Jerry. Um, and, and so far, I'm doing pretty well in that regard. Uh, but I went to the game, and, and, and Alvin Dark invited our little group down to the dugout for the Giants. And he introduced us to Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, and Juan Marichal. It was a pretty big night. Uh, uh, I don't have any trouble when people ask me, even though I've worked for all these different teams in baseball, who was the best player of all time? Willie Mays for me. You know, that first memory. Of, of, of who you saw play and where you went, you know, stays with you. Uh, uh, I, I told this story at an owner's meeting in baseball, as I told Charles um, earlier today, that there was an owner's meeting maybe around 1999 or 2000, and all of the owners uh, uh, sitting at a table were talking about their first baseball experience. And all of us had some version of the story that I told. Now, I, I went back to, to D.C. after this meeting, and, and two days later, I opened the mail, and there's a little box, and it says on the outside, San Francisco Giants. And I open it, and there's a baseball, and it's signed by Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, and Juan Marichal, with a little note saying, I hope you don't mind, we got Gaylord Perry to sign it, too. Uh, those of you that know baseball think that the ball was probably wet because he probably spit on it. But I, there was no evidence of that. If you don't understand who Gaylord Perry was, then go read about it. You should. Uh, uh, but, but that was a, a memory. Uh, uh, and the fact is, is that 
If you're wondering what this has to do with tonight's subject, as you'll hear from some of our speakers, it has everything to do with it. Because it has everything to do with that connection that you had with a sporting event that may have changed your life. It may have everything to do with the kind of personality you have, the kind of competitiveness you have, how much you love the game. The earlier you were introduced to whatever game you love most, the greater the likelihood you'll love it forever. And, and, and this is, has everything to do with what we're talking about tonight. You'll hear people talk about the economic pluses and minuses of, 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 of new ballparks, but I'm a little bit more of a romantic, and certainly our keynote speaker is tonight. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you, I think, uh, Denise, we've probably done 20 to 25 ballpark initiatives or arena initiatives or stadium initiatives uh, around the country. And I don't think we've ever won one uh, based on the economics. Uh, uh, it's always that intangible. And that is, what do you want in your life? Uh, uh, what about quality of life? And, and communities should have the right and often look for that right to decide if this is going to be part of what I want my life experience to be. Uh, now, certainly, you'll hear from people tonight about how that uh, 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 the economics certainly prove value. That you'll look at, at any new ballpark and stadium, and you'll probably be able to show that the revenues generated have been much more than was spent. But for me, that's almost beside the point. What is part of the point is exactly what I was told you about the memory. Uh, I, even after all the games I've been to, there's not a, a major league or minor league field that I walk into now that that first, that first view that I have of the, ball, the ballpark, that first pastoral view, does it make me 11 again? It's something special. It's something that, that really you can't put dollar figures on. And that sounds simplistic. It might sound naive. But it has everything to do with what you want your, your, your life to be. And, and in addition to, to the, the economic benefits that come to, to these ballparks and stadiums, uh, 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 I, I, anybody that lived in Louisiana post-Katrina uh, uh, can't say that, that a Tiger victory and, and, and a Saints Super Bowl didn't do a lot toward believing, convincing us that, that, that we'll be back. It was a feeling. And if we didn't have a super superdome, what would we, you know, we may go down to the quarter. You know, we may do that a couple of times, and it's a lot of fun. But we wouldn't have Super Bowls, and we wouldn't have bowl games, and we wouldn't have Final Fours. We wouldn't have conferences and conventions. And does it pay for itself? Yeah. But does it provide memories, and does it, does it provide almost a sanctuary for people from a secular standpoint that maybe otherwise wouldn't get together? Yeah, I live in Washington, D.C. right now, and, 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 and Nationals Ballpark may be the only place you can go in D.C. where you don't have to register to go in. You don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat or a man, man or woman. It, it, cut, it, it breaks down all of that garbage. And suddenly we can all just be baseball fans or Nationals fans. And, and, and that is vital. That's important to who we are. And what you're going to hear from a lot of people tonight is, yeah, you got to look at the dollars and cents. How you spend tax dollars matters, just like any infrastructure that you spend dollars on. But at the same time, what you're going to hear from a lot of these people tonight is that it has everything to do with, with your self-identity. Uh, uh, um, years ago, we did a, 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 a referendum in, in uh, uh, Wisconsin, and we found that 78% of the people in the state of Wisconsin had never been to County Stadium where the Brewers played. But of those 78% who had never gone to a game, 78% of them said, but it's part of my self-identity. That, that it matters to me to be a Badger, a Packer, a Brewer, or a Buck. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, Ron, if you grew up in the South or, or the West before 1957, then the southernmost and westernmost team was the St. Louis Cardinals. And no matter where you lived, if you were in the South, you pretty much knew what the Cardinals did on radio. I mean, that, that's who you followed. And just about every minor league team was associated with it. 
So what you're going to hear tonight probably is going to be as much about romance as it is about economics. And, and, and when you hear that, don't be surprised. And if you get that, congratulations. Welcome to the club. Because I think that we make decisions based on what we need and what's important to us, not just what we have to pay for it. Uh, our, our speaker tonight, our keynote speaker, is, is, is extraordinarily qualified to talk about this discussion. Now, uh, uh, oftentimes I have people say, how did you get to the sports side of this? About half our business is uh, advocacy work, uh, you know, whether it's environment, whether it's higher education, whether it's civil rights, a number of issues that we, we deal with, corporate reputation. Uh, and then there's the sports side. Uh, for some reason, Jerry, nobody ever asked me, how did you get into, you know, representing higher education? Or, you know, or, 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 or how did you get to, you know, work for some sort of economic development? I think they think that's the punishment part of the work. Uh, they're not wrong. Uh, uh, but on the sports side, we, 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 all of us would come in. We all have our own experiences in terms of the first time we went to a sporting event. Uh, but all of us also uh, tonight have different stories about how we came into the, the job we're doing. Charles did it probably the most, you know, the most usual way. I, I mean, nobody, I mean, you know, Charles said, I want to go into sports. I'm going to follow this path. So he did what every young person does that wants to get into sports. Uh, uh, he became a dentist. Went to dental school and said, you know, this is going to work out great for sports. But Charles grew up in Baltimore, and, 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 and you know, there was always this battle who do I love more, Paul McCartney or Brooks Robinson? And, and then he realized the likelihood that he's going to get to work on Paul's team at, at Abbey Roads was not great. But there's maybe he could do that for Brooks Robinson. So Charles goes to work for the Orioles. It is a team dentist. But Charles was extraordinarily curious and a little bit of a busybody. And he decided, you know what, I'm not going to just be the dentist. I'm curious as to why we do this or that at the ballpark. And isn't there a way we can do it better? And, and, and so what Charles did is, is again, uh, there's nobody like Charles, but he, in, in talking to the players, talking to the managers, talking to the general managers, and to the president and owner, just constantly asked questions and nudged in directions to get people to do things more innovatively and more interesting, uh, in a more interesting fashion. But Charles was a romantic about the game. You can't sit down with Charles and not hear stories. He's a great storyteller. Uh, uh, we went to the Jim Inkster show this morning, Jerry, and, and, and we were like three minutes into it. And Inkster says, Charles Steinberg, you're quite a storyteller. And I don't care if they're true. They're great stories. And, I, and that's, 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 I'll let the you know, reporters handle the facts on other things. Uh, the stories are really good, but Charles, you can, you can I urge you to, to Google Charles and see all the different things he's done. He, he, he was at the Orioles, he was at the Padres, he was at the Red Sox, he was at the Dodgers, uh, he's in the commissioner's office, now he's president of the, uh, of, of the Potomac, uh, it's Potomac, Paul Tuxent, uh, uh, Paul Tuckett Red Sox, we want to say Paul Sox, but that's just kind of a nickname of a nickname. Uh, 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 but he still works with, with, with the Commissioner Emeritus, uh, Bud Selig. Uh, now, I could go through what his titles were at each of those places, but it wouldn't do him justice. That, that Charles has always brought a unique blend and, and, and quality and value to what he does because he understands what all of us do that love sports for the first time. He's never lost track of his 10 or 11 year old self. He's never lost track of the fact that if I'm six years old, I may not understand uh, uh, a double steal, but I like the mascot. Uh, Charles is the kind of guy that went in, and, and most of the things that you now recognize in baseball, like scoreboards that light up and have videos, probably started with Charles. Walk-up music, probably started with Charles. I can't hear ACDC play Hell's Bells without expecting Trevor Hoffman to walk in from, you know, to, in the ninth inning. Uh, a lot of these innovations came because Charles said this is more than a game, and there are more ways we can connect 
with audiences. There's more that, that, that we can uh, uh, make accessible to families to make them love this game more. And 78% of every audience in, in Major League Baseball are people that come with their families. But what he's done is managed to say, as a musician and as a writer uh, 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 and, and, and as a filmmaker, what are the different elements that can make the ballpark experience the best? He knows that successful franchises have to do three things very well. They have to build a team that's competitive on the field. They have to create an unsurpassed ballpark experience. And they have to make sure that they uh, are, 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 do, have, do meaningful work in the community. Now, Charles has worked not just with building that ballpark experience, but he also built one of the, the healthiest and strongest uh, 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 sports foundations probably in the world with the Red Sox that I think they gave away in the, in the first 10 years of this ownership, $50 million, and, and then contributed another $50 million in in-kind to the New England area when he was with the Red Sox. He did the same thing with, with, with the Dodgers. Charles is a guy that looked at the game and said, how do we make this something that, that, that young people and old people and people in between say, this is a better experience than I can get sitting in front of the television or at a movie theater or any place else. He understands that when you go to a ballpark as a family that you get entertained, you get fed, uh, you get to be a real human being. The pace of the game for real fans is not that big an issue. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll let the, uh, 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 the media people deal with why we need to speed up the game. But the fact is, is there's an awful lot about the romance of these games that we want to preserve. Uh, Charles is a dear friend of mine. And, and, you know, one of the things that as you're growing up, if you're, 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 if you have a curiosity, and if that curiosity is encouraged, and if you live to be as old as I am so far, uh, uh, then you get to have special evenings, and we've all had them. Maybe around a hearth, maybe around a dinner table, maybe at a bar, maybe at a friend's house. When late into the night you have the best conversations you've ever had, and you share the best stories you've ever heard. And maybe you're witty, maybe you're smart, maybe you're inspirational. Maybe those things that seem hysterical at 3 a.m. aren't at 9 a.m. But we do remember that they were special to us. And many of those nights that I've had uh, were in conversations that I've had with Dr. Charles Steinberg. Uh, he's a remarkable man, a remarkable storyteller a man that looks at the game the way that uh, he did it at 10 and understands that if he does it well, then when you're 65 and 66, that you're able to, to recreate that feeling that you had when you were 10 or 11. Uh, I listen to what the man says, be entertained. My very good friend, Dr. Charles Steinberg. Doc. That was awesome, thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you, I have big dreams for each of you who are here today. I want each of you to enjoy the fulfillment of once in your life being introduced by Len Sanderson. You know, I feel like I, I just attended my own funeral. <laughs> I think I know now who I want speaking to deliver my eulogy. Um, thank you, Len. I may walk out from behind here. Um, I'd rather be among you uh, than uh, uh, separated from you. Um, when uh, Len and Denise invited me to come, uh, there really wasn't any question that the answer was gonna be yes. Um, number one, I'm gonna do anything Len and Denise ask. I, I not only love them both, uh, I have the greatest respect for them. What they have done uh, has been instrumental in changing the culture of cities, changing the culture of downtowns in America, and changing the quality of life for millions and millions of people who have no idea that they have done so for them. So the answer is going to be yes. Also, I have an old fondness for LSU. Growing up with the Orioles, uh, we had the number one pick in the country because we were so terrible in, um, in 1988. 
Uh, so in June of 89, and we got to pick Ben McDonald from LSU, who could hold seven baseballs in one hand. And I got to know Ben and his sister Pasha, and we, it was, um, it was, it was really fun. It, it's you know amazing what interpersonal moments create an affinity. And uh, uh, anytime I've met ball players along the way who have come out of of LSU, I'm like, oh, that's a good school, great baseball program. Oh my God, that's a good school. So I bring you greetings. Uh, actually, um, I wear four hats today, uh, these days. I'm president of the Paw Sox, that's the AAA affiliate of the Boston Red Sox, and we're trying to get a new ballpark. Not that there's anything wrong with our 76-year-old concrete, creaking, cracking, dilapidated concrete bowl that you can't play in if there's a threat of rain. But we would like to build a new ballpark, and we'd like it to be in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is just outside of Boston. It's about 45 minutes away. But you have to go through a political process, and you have to try to help people understand the role of ballparks, the role of baseball, the role of what it means to you to have a baseball team, and the contrary. What does it mean if you have something and lose it? There's, there's loss, there's grief there. But I also still help with the Boston Red Sox do a lot of the ceremonies and events that, um, uh, that uh, go on. We do a lot of those. Um, a third hat, uh, Len mentioned that I work with the Commissioner Emeritus of Major League Baseball, Bud Selig, and he has given me the honor of helping him with his memoirs. And if these memoirs come out the way they're shaping up to, it's going to be the Bible of the business of baseball. And the Bible of the business of baseball will have as its thesis love, harmony, relationships. As soon as you unify, as soon as you bring people together, you can accomplish great things. And as soon as you diverge, as soon as you bicker, as soon as you go and hunker down in opposition, you're dead. And one of the things that Bud Selig says often, he quotes the late commissioner of baseball, Bart Giamatti, who said baseball is a metaphor for life. And I'm enormously proud of baseball when it brings people together, when it brings people together from various geographical locations, from various demographic backgrounds, from all walks of life. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white or brown. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what sexual orientation you are. It actually doesn't even matter whether you know what an infield fly rule is. Maybe you just like hearing the Beatles songs that I'm going to make sure you hear if you're coming to a ball game where I'm still influencing the music. I saw the Beatles when I was five years old. I fell in love with music and the Beatles before I fell in love with baseball. They go together. There's a soundtrack at a ball game. And that brings in people who may not know the details and the nuances of the game, but they know that they're having a good time. Where else does everybody stop and stand up and sing a song written in 1908? Well, with the ball clubs, that I've been blessed to work with, we've added songs to that repertoire. In Baltimore, they sing, Thank God I'm a Country Boy. In San Diego, we introduced Hell's Bells. In Boston, we made Sweet Caroline a daily anthem that wound up having profound sociological impact. At the Dodgers, we played one day, just at the right time, Don't Stop Believing. And who was there? Steve Perry. He heard it. Got to meet him, talk to him about it. It became an anthem there. Music is a very powerful emotional force. And when blended with baseball, in a venue that's well-designed and well-located, you can create a civic gathering place that can completely change the nature of your city. But instead, you hear talk about economics. Should there be public funding for these venues? Well. If I were going to stand up here and talk to you about economics, not only would you fall asleep, but I would fall asleep. I don't know anything about economics. 
The only thing I know about economics is supply and demand. I don't know anything else. I really don't. I know this. I know that my understanding of the economic effects of a ballpark are measured not in analyses that get advocated by one side, refuted by another, and swatted like a badminton birdie to a draw, and it's a boring debate. Well, we did an economic study that shows $300 million or better. No, we saw the substitution effect means that they wouldn't have gone, they would have gone bowling if they hadn't, oh, shush. But ask the people who work at hotels in Milwaukee what it's like when the Chicago Cubs come to town. Ask the people who own the taverns in Boston when the New York Yankees come to town. Ask the taxi drivers, ask the Uber drivers, ask the Lyft drivers. Maybe they're the same, not sure. Ask the waiters and the waitresses who rely on those customers, who rely on those tips. And visitors tip well. That money matters. Ask the construction workers whose dangerous work builds these venues that reshapes these cities. Oh, no, no, the opponents say. Um, those are temporary jobs. Well, all construction jobs are temporary. You finish the project. You move on to the next one. The wages these construction workers earn, that's dinner. That's rent. And maybe it even helps with tuition. What's the alternative? Not building a ballpark? How does that help you? How does it make you a better city if you don't have a unifying magnet? Yeah, 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 we know that, but you should pay for it yourselves because all owners are rich. It's true. All owners are rich. They've been rich, not today, they've been rich ever since baseball started. That's why they can buy baseball teams. Except cities with vision, cities with leadership, have realized that cities build and states build infrastructure so that business can do business. They might quibble about building a city hall. You have a state house here. Len showed me first thing we saw last night when I landed, my first time here in Baton Rouge. But I'm not sure about Baton Rouge, but people don't pay to go to city hall. You don't buy tickets. I don't think the mayor pays rent to work there. In fact, tell me what public infrastructure investment pays for itself. Build a library, it doesn't make money back. Build a prison, the prisoners aren't paying rent to live there. You build a ballpark, you make the money back. That's why it's very important to understand the difference between expense and investment. We're talking in Rhode Island about building a ballpark with a partnership with the public. We'll pay the lion's share. We'll pay the majority. We'll pay $45 million of a $73 million ballpark. We, not me. I don't have the land. I'm an employee. But the owners of the club will. The city is all for it. They'll pay $15 million because they're going to buy the land. They will own the ballpark. If you buy a house and you own the, the house and you own the land, that's an asset. That's real. You know it when you go to sell it. And maybe they will someday. Okay. And then the state pays $23 million. $1.4 million a year. Except one thing. The state makes $2 million a year on us. The state generates $2 million in tax revenue because our players pay income tax. And there's sales tax on that hot dog. But I told you, I'm going to put you to sleep if I talk economics with you. 
Human economics, fine. Talk about the people who are impacted. You want to bring jobs? You want to bring life? You want to bring national marketing so that everyone in the country can hear your city's name be talked about? I did TV this morning. I did radio later in the morning. I did TV in this afternoon. They all mentioned the Pawtucket Red Sox. How else was Pawtucket, Rhode Island going to get mentioned in Baton Rouge, Louisiana today? Well, we got a baseball team. But all of that, all of that is the badminton swatting, which you can't, you can debate it. And the economics prove, but you'll debate it to a draw. What you can't deny are the sociological benefits. You can't deny the community benefits. You can't deny that particularly baseball brings people from all walks of life together. Unifies communities, sadly, after some tragedies and traumas that all of us are aware of. When Yankee Stadium filled up for game three of the 2001 World Series after 9-11, Bud Selig writes about this in the book. He said, if you, he was trembling. He had to hold on to a railing. There was so much emotion seeing the President of the United States stand out there on the mound bravely to throw out that first pitch. I experienced a city go through trauma like I never thought I would on April 15th of 2013 when the Boston Marathon bombs exploded right near Fenway right after our morning game. We spent that year and later years caring for the people who were injured, comforting the families who suffered the greatest tragedy. We still do. Hollywood's made two movies so far. I recommend you see them, because they both have the same ending, the ceremony at Fenway Park. Two different movies, two different directors. One's called Stronger, just came out a couple months ago. One's called Patriot's Day. They both end with the ceremony that we orchestrated to help a community heal. You can't deny that. Don't talk to me about economics. We helped a city heal. But the part I love the most is the third part that you can't deny. And that's the intimate role baseball and in turn ballparks play in family. Applies to other sports too, but my love is baseball. So for all of you who are students and want to know what's it really like to work for a major league baseball club, minor league baseball club, here's how it works. And these stories, these three stories, will tell you everything you need to know. Grow up in Baltimore, get to work for the Baltimore Orioles, get to work for the San Diego Padres, get to live in La Jolla, have the ocean as my front yard. Sweet place. And then we move to Boston. Cold, gray. Beautiful spring day in Baton Rouge. What was it, 10 inches of snow again today in Boston? Ah, they're tough there. It was a bit of culture shock going from La Jolla to Boston. But we took over the Red Sox in 2002. And in November of 2003, November's the worst month of the baseball season. It's the month furthest away from baseball. And November in Boston, cold, gray, raw, thick, billowy clouds, and air that bites. And the only thing worse than that is being sequestered in a subterranean conference room in a budget meeting. Oh, where I have to sit across from three accountants whose role it is is to shoot holes in my proposal to spend money, to promote goodwill, to promote love, to promote harmony. Yeah, we don't need to spend that money, do we? And then my boss and friend, 
the president and CEO at the Red Sox sits at the head of the table like a magistrate deciding in this debate whom he will favor. And one guy in the middle says, Charles, do you really need $20,000 in the budget to do your caravans in the winter to each of the other five New England states where we take baseball players in the winter to meet fans, to promote the game, to foster harmony so that they can meet their heroes? After all, he said, we've sold out every game since May 15th of this year. And we're likely to sell out every game next year, even if we don't do a caravan. True again. And I said, no. We don't have to do the caravan. We can save $20,000. Check it off your list. Pat yourself on the back. Go home, have dinner, and say, I just saved the club $20,000. Knock yourself out. But don't think that the fans won't notice. Don't think that they won't see the hint of pullback. Don't think that they won't realize that the seeds of arrogance are being sown. They're going to know what you're up to. And they're not going to like it. And then I got more animated. And Lucchino goes, OK, OK, you made your point. We'll still do the caravan. He really wanted to do the caravan. He just needed me to make the argument so that he didn't look soft by spending money. I've never had that conversation with him, but I know that's how it is. Fine. Third week of January, 2004, the Red Sox are in this never-ending quest to win a World Series, which they hadn't won since 1918. January of 2004, third week. Well, if you think November's bad, third week of January in Boston, it's cold, it's gray, and, and the gray is the snow. It used to be white. Now it's all gray and black. And we get on the bus at Fenway Park in the morning with three good ball players: Jason Veritek, star catcher, Bill Miller, third baseman, Kevin Millar, fun, good first baseman, and our community relations folks and our Fenway ambassadors and our security people and our photographers, and we get on the bus, and we're going to do two events today. We need to be down in Warwick, Rhode Island by noon, and then we have to be in Connecticut by nightfall. Now remember, third week of January, nightfall comes early. So we get to the Warwick Mall in Warwick, Rhode Island, and there is a crowd in this mall for us, well, not for me, but for the three ball players, stunning. Well, we set up the table and the chairs and the pipe and the draping and security makes sure the line is all you know, secure. And the players start signing autographs. And I'm getting worried. And my dear, dear friend who heads community relations is even more worried because I rely on her for all of the details, all of the organization, all of the discipline, keep us on track, keep us on time. But she knows me. I don't want to leave until we've taken care of everybody, and it is a long line. I mean, the only thing worse than not doing the caravan is doing the caravan and then leaving you high and dry. We need to improvise. There's an ancient expression whose English translation is, everything for the children. Take care of the kids. Let's have the kids make a line. I can't, I can deal with a wounded adult. I don't want to, but I can't deal with a crying kid. And so the children make a line. That line is long. This is a Wednesday at noon. These kids are supposed to be in school. And the line is snaking through the mall. <sighs> Got to improvise again. There's no playbook for this. Now you'll know it when you, when you run ball clubs. I didn't know it. OK, let's take Bill Miller third baseman, have him mark the end of the line and work his way forward so that every kid either gets to meet Bill Miller or gets to meet Veritek and Millar. That way, everybody meets somebody, everybody gets their autograph, their photograph, and you got no crying kids. And that's what we do, and it works, and we're done, and security whiffed the players off to the bus, 
and they take down the pipe and the draping and the table and the chairs. Why is that kid crying? And here's this 11-year-old, pudgy, Norman Rockwell cheeks, tears coming down, look like the catcher in the sandlot, wearing a Jason Veritek jersey. I said, what's the matter? He goes, I got out of school today to meet Jason Veritek. I said, and you only met Bill Miller. He goes, I'm a catcher like he is. I thought, I knew that. Same body type. Got it. <laughs> well, baseball is supposed to teach you the lessons of life. And in Boston, the lessons of life are life's unfair, kid, and you better get used to it now because they're going to break your heart. They've been breaking our hearts since 1918. But I'm not from Boston. I'm from Baltimore. We were happy in Baltimore. We had world champions all the time. <laughs> I put my arm around them. I said, just come with me. That bus isn't leaving without me. And we nonchalantly walk through the mall. Mother's chasing us, saying, what are you doing with my kid? And I understand. <laughs> and we climb onto the bus, and he meets Jason Veritek, who graciously signs his jersey. Mom's taking pictures, meets Kevin Millar, reacquaints himself with Bill Miller, off they go, never asked his name, never knew. They go that way, we go that way, and we get to Connecticut and continue our path. So when Len says that I'm still 10 years old or 11 years old, I am. If I ever grow up, it's, I'm, I'm done. That's how you do it. Later that summer, 2004, I would love taking the train to New York on weekends when the Red Sox would play the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. I had no responsibility there. I could just be the fan that I am. So one Friday afternoon, I'm on the Othella, you know, the highest speed train that goes from uh, Boston to New York. And I'm, I'm happy. It's a Friday afternoon, and I'm, I'm going to New York for the weekend. And I take down the tray from the seat in front of you, you know, put that down, take out my work, and along comes the conductor, older guy. Tickets, tickets. And he looks at me and looks at the tray. And I've got the Red Sox media guy back there. What's that? I'm like, um, that, that's my work. What do you mean it's your work? I, I work for the Boston Red Sox. Well, what do you do? And I explain I'm executive vice president, public affairs. I remember, this is a train going from Boston to New York. This could go either way. I've been waiting my whole life to see them win. I won't live to see the day. <laughs> and you realize that actually went well. That meant he was a Red Sox fan. It's tough. It's a tough place. We had fans who live in New York. They're very brave and in the southern end of Connecticut. And we had promised them, if we ever won the World Series, we would bring the trophy to them. Well, we won the World Series that year. We won the 2004 World Series in historic fashion. Read about it. Well, here comes November. You know how November is. It's even grayer and darker. But we feel a lot better. And we get our group together to take the trophy down to New York. It was, I think it was the day after Veterans Day, around November 12th, like a Friday evening. And once again, we didn't have players, but we had security. We had videographer, photographer, ambassadors, community relations people. And the trophy is completely encased in a black and silver anvil case, like a giant footlocker that you can't see in it. It's big. Thank goodness security was there, because I wasn't going to be the one to push that. Well, we get on the train, and at the back of the train car is an empty space where they didn't put seats there, so that if people have big and bulky luggage, it can fit. Well, this fits and takes up the entire space, but it fit like a glove. And the security people put that trophy case right at the back of the train, and down the aisle comes the conductor, same conductor. 
who looks at security, looks at this big black and silver anvil case and goes, you can't put that there. And then he looks at me. And he looks at the, at the case. And he looks at me. Is that what I think it is? I said, it is. Can I see it? I said, you can. And we open up the case, and we take out the trophy, and he holds it like a baby in his arms, and we take a picture, and then we take pictures of everybody else on the train who wanted to hold the trophy. <laughs> Why not? I said, would you like to come to opening day next April when we give the rings to our players? And he goes, can I bring my son? I said, you can. Well, I arranged the tickets, I guess. You know, got two tickets for opening day next April. But we took pictures all winter long of people holding that trophy. They had waited longer than their own lifetimes. And for the cover of Red Sox Magazine, the program, in April, the first edition, I did a mosaic of all of these pictures, all of these pictures of people holding the trophy. I made sure that the train conductor's picture was on there. Just my little thing for me. That's what you do. That's how you do it. About two years later, January of 2006, it's time for the Red Sox to put tickets on sale, January 28th. And I want a billboard across the street from Fenway Park so that the traffic going by knows that we're putting tickets on sale January 28th. And I want a billboard that shows player-fan interaction. I don't just want players celebrating. I don't just want fans being happy. I want to show the connection. My desk is covered with slides putting them in a little makeshift thing. Slide after slide after slide after slide. Got it. This one. Three guys, about 20 years old, facing our right fielder, Trot Nixon, with Trot shaking hands with the one in the middle. And even though it's four profiles, you see enough of the four faces to see the glee, to see the gleam, to see the joy that they all have. That's the one. And I put up the billboard. I get a call a week later from Butch Stearns, who is a TV reporter for Fox 25 in Boston. He says, Dr. Charles, can I come over and do a story with you about that article in the Boston Herald today? I said, well, I'm afraid you're ahead of me. I haven't read the Herald yet. He said, oh, you got to read this. I said, what? He said, well, there's a couple, an older couple, and they lost their son in the military, not by gunfire. He was in the Navy, and he actually was killed by a drunk driver. And they're very spiritual, very religious. And they've been looking for a sign from above that their son is okay. And someone told them that you have a picture of their son on a billboard across the street from Fenway Park. And I said, holy, <laughs> what have I done? They said, no, 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 they take comfort in it. In fact, they've been eating at the restaurant that you can access that's in Fenway Park came on to sit beneath the billboard. They find comfort in it. Come on over. So he does the interview with me, and my message was what it would be. I, I clearly did not pick that slide. I was a messenger. I was an agent. In my belief, that was divine, that that slide was, was selected. Well, ESPN picks up the story. But now we've gone to spring training. Well, and it's ESPN. Yeah, they're happy to talk to me, but they want to talk to Trot Nixon. Well, Trot and I give two interviews, and we don't hear each other's interviews. Now, Trot is a born-again Christian. I'm a born-the-first-time Jew. And in completely separate interviews that we don't hear, we give the exact same interview. 
that we were messengers, we were agents, we were performing some divine function. Man. You know, we're still talking about baseball here. So now it's time for the billboard to come down, and we offer it to the family. And they thank us, but they say, you know, it's too big, we don't have a truck. We would need that. <laughs> Honest. They call back. They didn't call me. They called back and said, friends of ours have a truck. So there was even a ceremony. I, I wasn't there. I don't know if I was back at spring training. But there was a ceremony where we gave the billboard to the family. And off they went with it in their truck. A couple months later, June 30th of 2006, I closed on the purchase of a house near Boston on the beach. It was kind of getting back to the La Jolla that I left behind in San Diego, only Boston style. But it was really nice. It's a big old house on the Atlantic Ocean. Pretty cool. On July 1st, spring has come by July 1st in Boston, I'm sitting outside looking at the ocean on my porch with two friends of mine, one a college buddy and his wife. Both are astronomers at Notre Dame. And we're sitting there chatting, enjoying my first full day in this new house on the beach, on the ocean, in, in, uh, out near Boston. Two ladies get out of the ocean. They're probably in their 50s. And they come over. And they're very friendly, and they're very Boston. Hi, are you our new neighbor? I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm Charles. Hi, I'm Julie. This is my sister, Mary. Um, we're the Clancy's from Quincy, uh, a town nearby. Um, we're two of 10 children. Our mother is the matriarch. She's had the, fam the house since 1960. And all throughout the summer, our family members come here and, and use the house. I'm like, very nice. Uh, thank you. Um, it's great to meet you. I'm like, Thank you. They go. It was a very warm welcome. The next day is July 2nd. I'm sitting out there with Peter and Ariel, my friends. And a guy gets out of the water. And he comes over. And he says, um, he's about early 20s. He says, um, you're our new neighbor, I heard. I heard you met my mother. I said, yes, I'm Charles Steinberg. I didn't say Steinberg the day before. The day before, I just said Charles. He goes, it is you. It is you. Dr. Charles from the Red Sox. Oh, my God. We are such Red Sox fans. I can't believe this. You live next door to us. That's amazing. Oh, my God. I can't believe that. He said, you mean to tell me that you and Larry Lucchino are going to sit outside and talk baseball? I said, I hope so. It is. Oh my God, we love the Red Sox. They've been so good to our family and our friends. This, this is just awesome. I'll tell you what. He says, tomorrow night, we do a big bonfire on the beach. July 3rd, not July 4th. I said, got it. He said, you'll come and meet all of our family. I said, all the plants, he's from Quincy. He says, right. <laughs> July 3rd comes, sun goes down, it's very dark. That happens. They light this huge bonfire. I say to my friends, do you want to go? No, they're your neighbors. It's fine. So I go and wander over to this big bonfire, which is providing the only source of illumination. I, I, I've only met three people, and I don't know that well what they look like. Thank goodness the son comes over and says, Dr. Charles. Says, oh, right, Robbie, right, good. Yeah, you, here's my mom who you met, Julie, right, my aunt, Mary, right, gotcha. He said, we just love the Red Sox so much. He said, it's so amazing that you live next door. I mean, with everything, with the poster and everything, I said, I said with the what? He goes, well, hey, with, you know, with everything, like with the, with the story, with the, with the, with the poster, with, with, with Trot Nixon. I said, what do you know about the Trot Nixon poster? He goes, well, that's me and my brother in the picture with our friend, our friend who died. What? He said, yeah, that's me and my brother on each side of the guy. And you wanted to give the, the poster to the family. And they couldn't take it, because they didn't have a truck. I had the truck! Like, <laughs> like oh, again. Wow. That, 
was you? He goes, yeah. I said, you're my next door neighbor. He goes, yeah. Who was that? A man comes over, older man, gray hair. Says, I wanted to meet you. You've earned a good name in our community. I said, thank you. You're one of the Clancy's from Quincy? He goes, no, I'm Myron Cohen from Randolph. Okay? I mean, he's there at the bonfire. I said, well, how so? He goes, we know what you did in our community. We were friends of Larry Solomon. Larry Solomon, the, the train conductor. Like, he said, we know what you did. We know that you got him the tickets to opening day. We know that the picture was on the cover of the magazine and you let him bring his son. But here's what you didn't know. He told you he thought he'd never live to see the day that the Red Sox would win. That's because he had leukemia and he knew he didn't have that much more time. He passed away that next summer, but not until after he had gone to opening day with his son and saw his picture on the cover of the magazine. You earned a good name in our community. I thought I was about to die. I thought this was the culmination of, of a Broadway show. <laughs> and then I go to Fenway Park. And, my, and I'm in the green, the, the red conference room, so named because it has red chairs. And my cell phone rings. Hello? And it's my buddy who sells corporate partnerships to sponsors. He's now the president of the team, Sam Kennedy. He goes, are you here? I said, yeah, I'm in the red conference room. He said, can you come into the green conference room? I said, yeah, green chairs. <laughs> Not a lot of imagination sometimes. Okay. Go into the green conference room, and there is Sam, kind of fidgety, kind of nervous, with three men out of central casting as business executives all with dark suits, salt and pepper hair, looking very handsome as they sit at this table. And Sam goes, um, thank you for coming in. Uh, we have a little problem. I said, what? He said, well, these gentlemen are from Gulf Oil. Okay? And we are trying to sign them to a very lucrative deal to put their Gulf Oil logo on the famous Green Monster in left field, in foul territory. And they <laughs> are not <laughs> signing it unless they meet you. And I said, well, that's very flattering. I said, but I'm not David Ortiz. And the one in the middle goes, no, but let me tell you who I think you are. He said, two years ago, the Red Sox had a caravan to Warwick, Rhode Island. I said, that's right. He goes, there was a little boy. And I said, wearing a Veritech jersey. He goes, that was my son. He said, you changed his life. You changed my son's life. He said, self-esteem can be vulnerable for anyone, especially for children, especially at 11 years old. He said, and he went into school the next day, and he had the autographs, and he had the photographs, and he was king of the class. You changed my son's life. There's nothing I wouldn't do for the Boston Red Sox, but I wanted to meet the people who changed my son's life. Now, I wish I could tell you that I then stormed into accounting and said, there's your $800,000 return on a $20,000 investment. <laughs> I didn't have the presence to do that. In fact, I then left the Red Sox to go to the Los Angeles Dodgers, then went to work for the commissioner of baseball. But then my old friend, boss, the magistrate, Larry Lucchino, asked me to come back to the Red Sox in 2012. And he was very pleased, because it was the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park, the first ballpark to live to see its 100th birthday. And while I was gone, he had a friend of his who was a very accomplished um, National Geographic documentarian make a video, a, a film 
about Fenway Park and its 100th anniversary. That's how important the ballpark is. It merited its own documentary. So I rejoin him, and I arrive in, in March. And I arrive, and he says, all right, come on with me. And we're happy to be back together. We had been apart for four years, and we had, you know, have a great relationship. So we get in the car. He said, um, I want to take you to see a screening of the documentary. I said, fine. It's his baby. We're driving through the western suburbs of Boston. We're chatting, catching up. We pull into a parking lot. We get out of the car. We go into some glass and steel typical business building. And, as, and he said, this, this documentary cost a fortune. And as I opened the door, I said, by the way, where are we? He said, oh, the underwriters. I said, oh, who did it? And he goes, Gulf Oil. And with that, Charles! Rick Derry. He said, you know, my son never forgot you. He still asks about you. I told you there was nothing I wouldn't do for the Red Sox. I wanted to say to Larry, look at that. I got you a whole documentary underwritten because of a little boy wearing a, a Veritech jersey. And then a year later, I'm looking at my emails, and there's an email from our head of HR, and it has your futures. All of these little thumbnails of our summer interns, pictures, name, school, favorite Red Sox memory or baseball memory. And every single one at this point says the same thing. Winning the 2004 World Series. Favorite memory, winning the 2004 World Series. Favorite memory, watching the Red Sox win the 2004 World Series. This one, when I was a little boy, the Red Sox had a caravan to war with Rhode Island. No way! And that little boy wound up working with us at the Red Sox. And he comes into my office, and he's still got the cherubic cheek. I said, look, I've told the story about us. Let me tell it to you to see if I'm telling it right. And I told him. He said, yeah, that was it. He said, but here's what you didn't know. He said, that morning, I was watching New England Sports Network, the network that covers our games. They had a little news show in the morning. And that's when I saw that Veritech was going to be at the Warwick Mall. And I go into my parents' room, and I say, you got to let me go to the mall. you got to let me miss school. you got to let me meet Jason Veritech. And they said, no, you have to go to school. And I bawled my eyes out, he said. I cried my head off. And I went to school. And then my mom shows up at lunchtime and takes me out. And then they don't meet him. And then, thanks to you, I do. And with that, he pulls out the photos that were taken on the bus, like with a piece of my head, like in the picture. That's all you have to know. That's all you have to know. You want to debate economics? I'd much rather live in a world in which you give for the purpose of giving, you do for the purpose of doing, you don't do it with the expectation of any return, it's not even a thought. That's the gratification. But when it does come back on you, it's the most extraordinary feeling in the world. And look at the profound effect it has on children, on fathers, on mothers, on aging relatives. That's not worth a public investment in a building. In my world, it is. Thanks very much. How about so you want to try? Two questions. Two questions. All right, from two courageous students. Not that you have to be a student. Yes, right over there. Ah, use the microphone. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're talking about uh, romanticism and kids returning to ballparks. Uh, can you comment on how you think uh, children who return to ballparks are returning to different ballparks when they're bringing their own kids than when they went to the ballpark when they were 11-year-olds, like in 
they returned as adults. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And I think that as long, it, look, it's wonderful to go back to the ballpark of your youth. It's wonderful to do that. That's very, it's very powerfully nostalgic. But as long as the children get to go to the ballpark, whether it's in Louisiana or Rhode Island, as long as they get to go there and smell the smells and hear the sounds and taste the nutritious cotton candy, what, uh, the nachos, whatever it is that, that helps all of your senses have this sense of wonder, the architecture of the ballpark matters. But that experience as a child, it comes back when you're an adult. And you can go to a different ballpark, but that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna tell your kid, well, I used to go to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. It wasn't nearly as nice as this, but the coolest thing for me was to get my nachos with jalapenos. The, the storytelling in baseball is one of baseball's greatest gifts and greatest assets. And parents and grandparents, great aunts, great uncles, all want to tell their stories. That, it, that are provoked by the nostalgia of going back to the ballpark, regardless of whether it was the same ballpark. But if that ballpark is no longer there, they're going to go there too. Because I take friends to where Memorial Stadium used to be. And thank goodness to our friend Cal Ripken, who laid down a field where it was. What is that, YMCA? YMCA there. But the field is still the field where my hero, Brooks Robinson, played third base. And I can look at it and still see what I saw. It's different, but I can still see it. So you're still gonna go. If you, if you grew up in Pittsburgh and went to Forbes Field, there's a piece of Forbes Field in the city, I, I think at Pitt, and you can go see it, and you do. So you'll go to another ballpark and still feel nostalgic, but you'll also go back to where a ballpark used to be. It's very powerful very powerful emotions. And all that is good is based on emotion. One more. Yes. Right. How you doing? Um, <coughs> my question was, um, for like, do you have any advice for the students here like that want to get into like what you're doing? Like, yeah. should we switch to dentistry or uh, like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I tell my students. I now teach sports communication at Emerson College, in addition to the other jobs. I'm looking for writers. I'm not looking for Hemingway. I'm looking for people whose spelling, punctuation, and grammar does not need my proofreading or my red pen. It is the accelerator. It is the relief, once again, good. If I'm going to let others see your writing, there are more serious grammarians than I am. And like it or not, I'll tell you the rules. It's up to you to heed them. But if I get that cover letter and that resume from that student from LSU who says, can I have an internship, please, at the Pawtucket Red Sox for the summer? The quality of that writing, of that cover letter, the accuracy in the resume is your claim of how, how attentive to detail you are. And yours will all be perfect because you're you. But you might have friends who aren't as attentive. And if there's a spelling mistake in there, you just lost. And you might have been really good. And it's our loss, I realize that. But you're competing with hundreds, sometimes thousands, of people who are sending us cover letters and resumes. And I had a fellow, and he was from Arizona, he spelled liaison wrong twice in his cover letter. That's not a typo, he did it twice. He doesn't know how to spell liaison. I had a fellow who worked for me and put a graphic on the screen of National Anthem, A-N-T-H-A-N. -A -N. I said, Tim, take a look at that. He goes, what? I said, it says A-N-T-H-A-N. -A -N. 
Yeah. No. I can't help you. I can't help you. At the professional level, you have to have already learned how to write accurately, professionally. You're hearing so much today about math and science. You're hearing so much about quantitative analysis. You're hearing so much about analytics. You're hearing so much about numbers. Fine. Knock yourself out. Do all that. Being able to write clearly and accurately, that is who is making our eyebrows go, hmm. Let's see if they can come in for an interview. Hmm. Let's see if we can Skype them. Now, any of you here tonight? Well, I, I, was, I, I was afraid to go into that story, but that's exactly right. At the Orioles in 1992, I am the resident English teacher. Yeah, I, I'm okay at it, but I'm doing it to protect all of my little chickens. Because if others see a memo that has errors, they're going to be lowered in the esteem of some of my colleagues and superiors. Particularly superior. So I get a cover letter. Ah, well written. Resume's good. Already on the school newspaper as a freshman. Went to a good school, not LSU, but Yale holds its own. Now, <laughs> writing for the school newspaper, writing sports. And I call him up. I said, You want to come in for an interview? He goes, Yeah, we're at the Orioles. It's 1992. He's not from Baltimore, Massachusetts. So why do you want to work for the Orioles? You're from Massachusetts. He goes, the Red Sox won't return my call. Well, I saw that the written communication was backed by a really strong knowledge of reading. I said, well, where does this come from? He goes, well, my twin brother and my sister and I are all required to read for an hour for every hour of TV that we watch because our father is a professor of creative writing at Boston University. I said, wow, that's such a good idea. And he goes, no, it's not. <laughs> OK, well, got you the job. And uh, yeah, that was Theo Epstein. And um, uh, he worked for us three years at the Orioles. We took him with us to the San Diego Padres uh, while he, um, w he had already completed his Yale education by the time we went to San Diego. and then. Um, uh, we, we encourage him to go to law school, get a law degree. And um, I would say the rest is history, but I would, it's probably more accurate to say then he made history. You know, the general manager when we won that 2004 World Series, the general manager when we won the 2007 World Series, and then the general manager, the president of baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs. So for me, short fat Jewish kid from Baltimore, got two hits in two years of Little League, to end up with three world championship rings from the Boston Red Sox, I can say it all comes down to grammar, punctuation, and spelling. <laughs> Thanks very much.